I'm Les Bennett. I have the honor of hosting a series of interviews with outstanding pharmaceutical scientists for the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. The objective of the AAPS series is to have an opportunity uh, for individuals to get to know and to hear the ideas and the background of individuals such as our guests today in terms of the tremendous advances that they have given to the pharmaceutical sciences. Today we are pleased to have with us Professor Nicholas Pepys and Nick is the Fletcher Stuckey Pratt Chair of Engineering and Professor of Biomedical Engineering, Professor of Chemical Engineering and Professor of Pharmacy uh, at the University of Texas. When you get a letter from Nick, there's no room for the text, it's all his titles. <laughs> so Nick, we're very pleased to have you with Thank us you very today much, and to share with us uh, your background and information. Thank you, Les. So Professor Pepys got his undergraduate degree in Athens, uh, Greece, where he was born, and then came to MIT to get a degree there, and then moved into the area of pharmaceutical sciences. So Nick, why don't you give us a little background of, you know, what was the progression that led to you becoming a pharmaceutical scientist? Well, that's very good, really. Uh, well, thank you for having me here today. Uh, when we started, as when we finished graduate school at MIT, these were the days that mathematical modeling was a very, very important subject for engineers. And when I started at Purdue University in 1976, uh, I had the fortune to meet a young postdoc by the name of Robert Gurney from the University of Geneva who was on sabbatical in the pharmacy department. And together we started talking about the future of pharmaceutical sciences and drug delivery. These were the early days of Alza Corporation and uh, some of the other luminaries in the field. And so it was natural for me to enter this field from a mathematical point of view. That is, looking at how we could design drug delivery systems that will pro would provide specific uh, profiles for delivery. These were the early days, you remember, that we were still excited about in vitro design of such devices. A and that led to my starting collaborating with other people in pharmacy at Purdue University and also throughout the world, as you know, I've been very active in interactions with uh, the University of Paris, the University of Parma, University of Santiago de Compostela, and also with Hoshi University in Japan. So the early years, the first 12 or so years, were years of design of new devices and new systems. And you remember at that time, zero-order release was really a major, a major uh, new goal of the field. Uh, companies were very interested in that work. But by about 1985, 1988, it became clear that biological aspects of uh, drug delivery were very important. So we started design based on an in vitro in vivo correlation and v basically bringing back the ideas that you had promoted in your own work since the early, the late 60s and early 70s. And I think it was at about that time that we met too. Um, so for me, yes, engineering was my basis, but it was always interaction with pharmacy, with the pharmaceutical sciences. And uh, I'm very proud that AAPS has done so much for us. Uh, I, w I remember the meeting in Minneapolis where I was in that meeting, that room where we decided to start AAPS. And of course, you were one of the founders. You're the founder. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So let's say, what, what's... What do you think today, the engineering interface with pharmaceutics? Is this a major area of bioengineering and uh, today? Is it? Uh, it is quite surprising considering how we started 30, 35 years ago, how Bob Langer and I and a few others started, how drug delivery and pharmaceutical engineering have become an integral part of chemical engineering and biomedical engineering. I can tell you as I go around the country and you know that I have very important positions in the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and the Biomedical Engineering Society, I see now that there are sections 
five, six, seven professors working in the field of pharmaceutical devices, pharmaceutical products. And what engineers do now is they help with the understanding of engineering design and engineering processes in two areas. One is the area of manufacturing, designing better systems, more complex systems, especially for new proteins, genetic, genetically engineered proteins, what we call in AAPS biotechnology. The other is in the medical devices field, and I'm pretty sure you have seen it yourself. Uh, there is really a major interest right now in developing a new generation of nanotechnology-based devices and microtechnology-based devices that could be used in contact with the body or in the body, including microchips, including, of course, nanoparticular systems and so on. Yeah, so let me see this. Professor Peppis is the director of the Center of Biomaterials, Drug Delivery, Biotechnology, and Molecular Recognition, which just is, encompasses just what you said. Tell us about the center at the University of Texas. The center is a center that is uh, based mostly in the biomedical engineering departments, but it has, department, but it has interactions with uh, the other components of engineering and with pharmacy. And it is a center in which we try to design new biomaterials that can be integrated into an intelligent system, be that a microchip or another type of device, in order to be triggered and release a particular drug, or in most cases a therapeutic protein, over a period of time at a desir desirable rate. And this is a response to the needs for new and improved methods for delivery, especially of proteins, uh, but also other drugs. And uh, it requires a little bit understanding of how potentially someday we will be able to recognize the cause of a particular disease. Uh, when you see the word molecular recognition, you understand immediately that we are trying to recognize, for example, glucose in the body under certain conditions and trigger a release mechanism for release of insulin. This is not easy. And in fact, it's an idea that was promoted by Emil Fischer a hundred years ago, when uh, at the time of he was getting his Nobel Prize. Uh, and it's coming back. Uh, also the ideas of Paul Elrich, of course, with the nanorobots and so on. The problem is that right now we are in a cusp, in a very difficult period in the pharmaceutical and the biomedical industry. Uh, funding has become a little bit more difficult than before. And many of the ideas that 10 years ago would have been promoted and pursued right now are looked upon uh, and discussed again and again before additional funding can be provided. And this is something that worries me, and uh, it worries me because I want to see improvement of uh, technologies for the treatment of pa patients. But at the same time, I do understand that FDA requires that all these products be checked very, very carefully, and this takes a long time. So you've given us a little history going to Purdue first and then University of Texas, I think in 2002? 2002. 2002. So it's been 10 years. So I'm interested from a pharmaceutical sciences perspective of your recruitment into engineering at Texas. Do you think this is a recognition of the university that, you know, that more than one area should be pursuing the pharmaceutical uh, sciences? Uh, yes, it is, absolutely. And probably the same thing happened in your university in the late 90s there was an interest in what we call cross-disciplinary hiring. And at that time when I was contacted, I was contacted by a biomedical engineering department, but I hope I don't mind mentioning the name, Steve Leslie, who was the, uh, the dean of pharmacy at that time, and he's now provost of the university, was very much interested in this interaction. And so the appointment was joined in the departments, and the idea was that we would be working together. And we have been working together with uh, several colleagues uh, trying to do, really to come up with the new devices, the new systems. Yeah, that's good. But as I say that, uh, I mean, I hope I'm not pontificating here. I I'm pointing out something that I think is very important for our field. If you open the better pharmaceutical journals in the field and you start reading about some of the new developments and new ideas that academics promote, 
you realize that they will take, these ideas will take a long time before they become products. And this is what I want to stress, because I, like ma many others, have started some companies through VC. Uh, what I want to point out is that uh, academics are a little bit naive at the beginning. They think that perhaps with a VC of two to three million dollars they can start a company and take a product to the market and uh, it, it takes quite much more money. We have now, uh, uh, you know, startup companies that after five or six years they die, you know. They, some of them go for ten years and then, <laughs> and then they fold. And, and this is something that I'm trying to tell the new generation, that, you know, the ideas are great. I think doing a PhD or a postdoc in an educational environment on an educational research project is a wonderful idea. It makes you solve problems, understand how to solve problems, but at the same time realize that taking this idea and making it a product requires much more. <laughs> So that, that is, leads into a very nice uh, segue into the c potential conflict of the university professor and the company and how this affects graduate students, postdocs, and this. Can you tell us how you've solved that? Because you've started companies and you've been very successful as a scientist. Well, what's, what's your philosophy there? Well, my philosophy is a little bit the old-fashioned philosophy, <laughs> which is, I supervise graduate students and postdocs for, as I call it, educational research, to learn how to solve problems. If a new product comes as a result of that, that's great. We will go and file. The university will file for you know, a patent or a provisional patent. Uh, but like other major universities, at the University of Texas, we have a rather strict procedure whereby I have to declare any conflicts of interest, if a company is to start and I'm going to pay for some of the graduate students from funds from the company, there has to be a whole structure created, what we call a management plan. And uh, I feel very confident that one can continue doing academic research, understand processes, understand phenomena, understand mechanisms, at the same time contribute to a company whose eventual goal is to bring that product to the market to help the patients. And I'm very passionate about that, that what we are doing is we are trying to help the patients. But in all the years I've worked either with major companies or with my own companies, I have never accepted funds to come back to pay for my graduate students. I know that this is a little bit of a utopia, but it has applied in my case. And I know that it has applied in your case and many other major scientists. Uh, it is something that we need to be careful about, especially as the universities are extending now towards using the faculty as a way to start new companies. You know, There has to be always a check. And as you know, the National Institutes of Health this year, on April 24th, set some very, very strict regulations, April 24th, 2012, some strict regulations about conflicts of interest. If you haven't filled out the new forms, uh, you will be surprised <laughs> <You should> <laughs> about the kinds of information they are requiring. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, Professor Peppas is very well known, very outstanding. He's an elected member of the National Academy of Engineering, elected member of the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Sciences, has published over a thousand publications, has more than 28,000 citations, and more than 25 patents. So Nick, what's your, what's your favorite paper? Not necessarily your most highly cited paper. What's your favorite well, uh, paper? Uh, it might be your most highly cited uh, paper. The, my, mo my, my favorite paper has become the most highly cited paper at the same time, simply because at some point in your career you realize that what you do is to try to help people do better work. When I started in the field, I was aware of the Higuchi equation. I loved Tai Higuchi. I met him towards the end of his life. I remember meetings in Geneva in 1979 where we spent wonderful time talking about how he had come up with a very simple equation that all of us call the Higuchi equation. I felt that there were systems where that equation could not be applied 
I was working with such systems, the so-called zero-order release systems, and in 1981 and 82 we developed another equation that has become, some people call it the Pepper's equation or whatever, uh, it's a misnomer, it's actually Richard Korsmeyer and Nicholas Peppers. Richard is at Pfizer, he just became a member of the National Academy of Engineering. That equation has been used by everybody. Is it my best paper? It's the most cited paper. Uh, but it helps people. People use it to analyze, uh, you know, uh, how drug delivery takes place in certain systems. And I'm pretty sure knowing your work, probably, you know, you can say the same thing. There is one particular theory or mathematical model or a pharmacodynamic expression that you like more than anything else, you know. Uh, I, I'm really very proud of that development. It happened 30 years ago. Of course, my more recent work on oral delivery of proteins makes me quite proud, especially the work on interferon beta. Uh, but, but that's still really... <laughs> So you, you mentioned before, and I'd like to come back to it, yeah. the, the, your obligations and what you've been doing uh, organization-wise to move the field forward mm -hmm. and your thoughts on what are the responsibilities of a pharmaceutical scientist and how you have tried to fulfill those obligations. Yeah. Uh, I have tried to do that. I mean, I, I, I feel that in the long run, those of us who are in public institutions, we are paid by the taxpayers. We owe, we owe it to the taxpayers to pay us to give something back. Not just simply an invention or a patent or a few papers, but something else. And if we are reasonably well educated, I think we should help the public in such a way. So that's why I'm very active in the Institute of Medicine, as you are. Yeah. Dr. Bennett is also a member of the <laughs> Institute of Medicine. He didn't mention that. We go there, and actually I just came back from that meeting. Uh, we talk about public policy, and we talk about health issues that will affect this country. For example, how are we going to fund uh, treatment of very difficult diseases where we have right now really very expensive products to, to, to treat those diseases. And I do contribute to that aspect, but I also contribute on the educational aspect, Educa educating the public through engineering, for example, through the two major engineering societies where I'm involved, and also the National Academy of Engineering, on what the future is going to be. People hear the word nanotechnology in drug delivery. They don't know what it is. They are worried. Should they be worried? Perhaps they should about the impact of uh, nanoparticles, let's say, in the body. But you need to have engineers such as Bob Langer, myself, and a few others who go in and present really the latest data and at the same time direct uh, uh, the government, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and of course the societies towards the new ideas and the new goals for the field. So that's why I contribute really in service. There's a very controversial thing happening in Texas right now with the cancer funding and our Nobel Prize winner, Al Gilman, retiring from the feeling of not peer review of science. Uh, you know, people are going to look at this video for years. Uh, this is 2012, October. And they will uh, compare five years from now <laughs> what we said right now. Yeah, and uh, it's a really interesting dynamic yeah. of... Uh, concern about, you know, yeah. where the decisions are in terms of science funding. You want to make a comment about that? Uh, <laughs> you don't I, have I will to. make a simple comment. Uh, <laughs> uh, Professor Bennett is talking about the um, Cancer Prevention Research Institute of Texas, the CIPRIT, uh, which has really changed the way we do uh, cancer research in Texas and has really affected the University of Texas at Austin, all the medical schools, Baylor and Southwestern, of course, Rice and so on, and which has led, he doesn't want to hear that in public, to our being able to attract to Texas some of the major names from California uh, with large startup grants. This has been done by a process that has been extremely uh, extremely carefully done, really. The, uh, the process includes uh, research uh, review panels, and by the way, our review panel was headed by Phil Sharp, Nobel laureate from MIT, 
And Dr. Gilman was the uh, director or the president of the Cypriot until October 1st, I think, uh, when he's another Nobel laureate. And what Les is talking about is the allegations or the questions that were made recently, perhaps a few months ago, uh, that uh, perhaps the review process, uh, uh, there were some questions about the review process. I personally have not seen it. My department has been the recipient of about six million dollars, including startups for a young lady who came from Stanford and who is doing absolutely marvelous work on immunology and cancer. Uh, distinguished professors like Professor Georgiou from IO, IOM member and NAE member and so on. And what has been funded by CIPRIT has been first rate. I think the concern is that if you noticed in the initials, it's not cancer prevention and research. So the concern is that perhaps some more funding should be given for prevention rather than research on cancer treatment. And I think there is a small direction, a uh, change of directions. What's going to happen? I don't know. As you know, the announcement that Phil Sharp is uh, stepping down happened last week. Dr. Gilman had announced that in July. Uh, I believe that we're going to be able to find uh, new, uh, new leaders in this program. The program is going to stay. It's a marvelous program. It was created by Kirk Watson, former uh, mayor of Austin, who is now a state uh, congressman and who is really a, a visionary into how to treat cancer. I don't know how you see it in California, how people see it on this coast, but for us it has changed. Oh. I, I just couldn't resist. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> so I, but let's get back to your, to, you know, where you go. And, so yeah. what do you see, you've already mentioned your concern that maybe there isn't going to be funding for some of these new mm -hmm. ideas. Yes. What do you see happening in this biomedical pharmaceutical sciences interaction in the future? Where, where is it going to go? Yeah. I think we are going to be bringing together much more closely together the uh, medical scientists, the pharmaceutical scientists, the chemists and biologists, and perhaps the engineers. And why not even the businessmen? Dog was the solution or the improvement of the treatment of patients, the solution of major medical problems. I strongly believe it's something that Phil Sharp calls the convergence in biomedical sciences, which is something that I think many of us would have called cross-disciplinary research 30 years ago, but it's much more impactful and uh, the people work much more closely together. Uh, I really think that uh, society tells us which diseases are very important. There is definitely a direction for towards cancer, but towards treatment of neurological diseases. Uh, and we're going to continue working in those areas. Uh, I believe the pharmaceutical industry is going to be in the forefront in those new areas. There's definitely a realignment in the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, you would see the major pharmaceutical companies talking about new tablets and capsules and so on. Right now, there is emphasis much more towards the treatment of major diseases. Let's get back to the academic aspects yeah. of it, because you've trained over 70 PhD students and uh, maybe 150 visiting scientists in your laboratory. What, what's your, what are you looking for and what's your interaction and, and what do you want them to accomplish? Uh, uh, well, in, with, yeah. in their training with you? I love working with people. I, I love taking a young uh, senior, just finished senior year in chemical engineering, biomedical pharmacy, and delivering several years later a young scientist who is independent and works on the field and tries to solve uh, important problems. I educate them the same way I was educated. I was educated at MIT by some luminaries in the field, some major figures in the field who taught me, you're entering a medical field, your first idea is find a way to help patients. Uh, as you probably don't really know, my, my mentor was Professor Edward Merrill. He is 89 years old. And he was the mentor of other major like Bob Langer, Mike Sefton, and so on. And he was a man that would go in the hospitals in the 60s and 70s and 80s trying to give solutions.
to the treatment with using artificial kidneys, to the treatment of the high lean membrane disease, respiratory distress syndrome, and so on. And we were taught that. So this is what I have transferred to my, student, the ex my students, the excitement for solving medical problems. And I do that by asking them to take right from the beginning strong chemistry, bio, biology and biochemistry backgrounds, very strong engineering background, including mathematics, and of course, very strong courses in pharmaceutical sciences. And uh, they work hard, they work for long hours, and many of them decide to become professors after that. And uh, So there's no secret, it's just, I, I, I still see my students once a week. Each one of them, for half an hour these days, not an hour anymore, but half an hour, but you know, I see them and I want to see their progress. What about the growth of the field in terms of attracting students? Is it, is it doing well still? And I think that uh, I see no problem right now. Uh, in uh, chemical and biomedical engineering, we have so many students who want to work in this specific field. Uh, they want to contribute. They have reasons for that. Some of them may have a relative or a grandparent so on that suffers from diabetes or cancer or whatever, and they see it as a way to give back something or to help that parent. But the reality is they get excited. Every year in chemical engineering, biomedical engineering, we have more students than we can handle. I mean, typically we will get 50, 45, 50 new graduate students and in chemical engineering, half of them want to work on bio. In biomedical engineering, of course, everybody wants to work on bio. Pharmacy, the same thing. And uh, so it's an exciting future. And despite all the comments we hear about uh, difficulty in getting NIH grants and so on, I find that there is still funding for good ideas. Also, there is funding for support through fellowships. Uh, I don't know how you're doing in California, but in our university right now, more and more students get NSF fellowships. About half of my students right now have NSF fellowships, which means they are paid for three years, the first three years, by the government. It reminds me a little bit about the, the, of the European system, where the students are paid by the government, and the professor provides the supplies and expenses. You know. Did you ever have a thought of going back to Europe? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did in the 80s, but then I met my dear wife, who is also a biomedical scientist, and uh, she's American, and of course I stayed in the United States, I'm an American citizen, and uh, I love Europe, I go back to Europe, I have so many friends in Europe. Uh, this is something that I really want to stress. Uh, there, are no, there are no borders, I mean, we all work across lines. Some of my oral delivery work on insulin was done with Japan with Hoshi University. Uh, I contributed to the work of geomatrics with Paolo Colombo in Italy, so, you know. Actually, you, you sort of precluded the next thing I was going to say. Some, someone would worry, how can someone with a thousand, more than a thousand publications have a wife and children? So, in, well, in it, your home life. That's, it, came, it came late of life, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, we, we got married uh, when I was 39 years old and we started a family, wonderful family, and believe me, I, I am also, I hope, a good father. <laughs> they will hear it someday and they will comment on it. I would like to come back to one of the questions that you had earlier because I being, of course, a pharmaceutical scientist but more a biomedical engineer, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in the third world and I don't know how much we discuss that in AAPS. There are several of us, many of us, who are very concerned about improving the conditions of treatment uh, in third world countries. There are countries in Africa where the annual budget per patient is about 15, for, for medical expenses, $15 a year. There are countries where there is one MRI unit in the whole country to treat 10 million people. And so, being a biomedical engineer, I'm very concerned about that. And we are working right now we had a Gates Foundation grant, we just finished on oral uh, vaccines, and we are working really on improvements as a department on improvements of treatment in third world countries. Uh, simpler devices to treat cancer on the skin, to, 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 to detect cancer on the skin, and so on. And uh, I think there are quite a few foundations now that are very interested in this type of work. Yeah, I think that's very admirable and 
of yeah. course, I think there's a lot of us that are interested yeah, in yeah, that. Yeah, of course. So good. Well, Nick, it's been a pleasure having you. Thank you, you very much. Liz. Thank you for sharing it. your Thank views you. with Thank the you. audience. Thank and you very much. Uh, good luck in the future. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you.